Library sits on the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Huron Lindac. We understand that Propeller Art Gallery operates on land that is governed by the Toronto Purchase Treaty 13, the Two Row Wampal Treaty, and the Dish One Spoon Treaty. The gallery also operates on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. We are committed to peacefully sharing and caring for resources around the Great Lakes and operating the gallery on the principles of inclusiveness as we continue to exhibit art created by artists from all over the world. Thank you. And welcome to Propeller Gallery. This is an amazing turnout. Thank you so much. So Propeller Gallery is an artist-run space um, in the West, Queen West Cultural Zone, that's what we call it now. We used to be on Queen Street, but we've been here for a while. Um, our mission is artists empowering artists. We recognize the importance of giving emerging artists and curators an uh, opportunity, uh, opportunity to exhibit in a professional setting. So um, we assist them with uh, uh, familiarizing them with the process of uh, promotion, hanging, and basically putting on an exhibition. This award has been in partnership with the Toronto Outdoor Art Exhibition. So I would like to introduce Anya Harwata, who is from the Toronto Outdoor Art Fair. And she will say a few words about the TOEF. Thank you so much, first of all, everyone for being here. This is a really fantastic turnout. On behalf of Toronto Outdoor Art Fair, the entire team and board of directors, I just wanted to start off and say a huge congratulations to each and every one of the artists and to the curator Lex on a really fantastic show. It's always been really important to us to provide opportunities for emerging artists and curators uh, that are meaningful but also impactful and practical. The Emerging Artist by Emerging Curator Award does just that here at Propeller Gallery. And uh, our huge thanks to the Propeller Art Gallery team for putting this show together so diligently. And thank you, Francis, for being a true thank champion you. for emerging artists throughout your time here, not only as a Propeller member, but um, on the board and uh, on the TOF board as well for thank more you. than 20 years. So thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to say congratulations again to all of the artists, and we can't wait to see what you all do next. Thank you. So the Toronto Outdoor Art Fair has grown incredibly. When I was first on the board, uh, it, we had to actually mark the square, we do everything. Now it's like a completely professionally run out of the office. So that's fantastic. Um, so this exhibition came about because I recognized that emerging artists were having a really hard time getting their work out there because uh, galleries were disappearing. You know, every, every so often, you know, they close up shop because financially to show in this area, especially, has gotten really, really expensive. So I'd like to thank Megan Deeks of the Wood Gundy CIBC Financial Group who helps to support this exhibition. And it's, uh, I think from 2016 we started it. And it was just a pop-up and it's grown to two galleries over a three week period, which is great. And I hope we can keep it going. I'd also like to thank um, Anahita Azrahimi, Director of TOEF, Anya, and Operations uh, Manager, and Kimberly Dewing, who's the Marketing and Program Coordinator. There's Kimberly, say hi. Hello. Um, and a huge thank you to Dominique Prévost, who helped hang the exhibition, and the artists as well who helped hang. Um, so also, last but not least, I'd like to Thank Tom Taylor, our lovely propeller director. Who, yeah. Without Tom, uh, he makes all things happen. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, okay, so now I would like to introduce Lex Berry, our emerging curator. Here, <laughs> this is Lex Berry. Take you. Over. Mm -hmm. by Francis last summer to do this show. Um, I was originally asked to pick uh, and be a judge for the Toronto Art Art Fair uh, and choose four emerging artists to do a show for Propeller. Um, it was a hard choice, um, but I never regret for a second the four that I chose. Um, I didn't expect the amount of connections that the four of them would have when I chose them, but I am so proud and so grateful to all four of them for all the hard work they've put in for this show. 
Um, I met with each of them over Zoom, as most of us meet nowadays with COVID. <laughs> um, and I, I met Mark first um, in November, the beginning of November of last year. Um, and I'll never forget our meeting. It was it was funny because uh, Mark, the first thing Mark said to me was, I didn't prepare anything for this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't help but laugh. Um, but it, it, it so wasn't true because he spent the next half an hour showing me the whole layout of his artwork, every step, every process, and it, it was the same when I met Siobhan afterwards. Um, my mouth just open, gaping, like staring at all these processes. It was, it was amazing. Um, but there was one thing that Siobhan said that I, I wouldn't forget, and that's that he was searching for the idea of beauty. And that's kind of where this whole idea started. Um, when I met Sandy, she was kind of my, my savior. I was so into this show that I forgot about an assignment for class. This is the fourth student I am. <laughs> um, and uh, I asked Sandy if I could actually interview her to do the assignment, and that is what I did, so I will always be grateful to you for helping me with my schoolwork, as well as doing this show, um, because it was just an amazing process to hear about the backstory of everything that you've done so far. Uh, I met Ren last, but <coughs> definitely not least, because we had a great connection to each other. He showed me all of his work, um, and it was just amazing to hear the stories behind where he came from. So the whole show is about the idea of life experiences and this idea of where beauty comes from. And each of them show a different way uh, in their artwork and in their process. I, I encourage everybody to speak to all of them because, like I said, my mouth is still open. I'm still gaping at the, the experience I had getting to know them and getting to know their artwork. And I am so grateful to have been able to put it up in the gallery the way that we did. Um, I'd like to end my little spiel here by saying a quote I learned in uh, one of my classes is that the curator is someone that is a guest in the artist's world and as a good guest uh, you should always say thank you. So, so thank you to the four of you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now pass it on to Mark who will show us this side of the wall if we all want to move over here. Mark. Um. To explain what I do, I think I have to talk about uh, how it's made. Uh, I photograph, uh, uh, I take pictures of uh, uh, paints, spills, and splashes. Uh, I, do, uh, I do it to keep it looking fresh. And um, I piece it together like a puzzle afterwards in uh, Photoshop. So. Uh, that allows me to use uh, weird materials such as uh, uh, cooking cream, uh, food coloring, uh, what else? Uh, uh, spit, soap, <laughs> and uh, I, as my canvas, I sometimes use uh, aquariums, empty plates, or uh, scrap pieces of paper that I throw away after. And for uh, to replace my brushes, I use uh, droppers or syringes or straws. And uh, photography allows me to do this because these materials wouldn't wouldn't stay uh, in the form that I, I take pictures of them. They would dry, and there'd be not much to see otherwise. So that's, that's pretty much. It, then I layer it, blend it, and uh, mask it uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Mark about his process? Where so you when are? you start the painting, like painting, yeah. when you're speaking, uh, and you have all these materials that are perishable. How long does it take, for example, from beginning to the time you take the digital photo? Yeah, that's hard to say because I spend some some time is common to all the pieces. I kind of build a bank of of uh, paint splashes and then I, I draw from there when I need to. But uh, typically, one of the big ones can take one week to to produce. Uh, change with the process, like sometimes at the beginning or sometimes through? 
Oh, the, the, the figure is always yeah, it's there from the beginning. From the beginning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much blended. I copy it like a, a 20 times sometimes to blend it with each single uh, uh, paint splash. So do you start with the image first and then incorporate the colors, or do you decide on a color theme first and this decide on the person, the photograph? That, that, that depends maybe from one time to another, but that, that, the thing to be said about that is also that, that uh, when you blend the, the different colors coming from different like color spaces, it distorts and I, I, I don't have full control of the, the color. I, if I want to bring it back to what I had in mind, I really need to correct it afterward. But sometimes it's just like a happy surprise. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you, Mark. Yeah. I like thinking of paint as like a very sculpturally form. Um, and what I've sort of done with the collection here was it, it, it kind of came after I moved from one studio to the next studio space. And then it started with this larger piece and then I followed it in different directions. And I, I do believe I have a lot of a lot more to explore within this because this is like the first dive into it. But it starts with these objects that I've collected over the years, as well as connections with friends. So this painting here, uh, the gaze of the subject is kind of in our conversation. Because I just had a friend come over. I set up a still life on a table. We drank like a bottle or two of wine. <laughs> and just talking for a while. Burned the candle out. And yeah, I, I, like, the way that I started my work was more um, small kind of studies. And so this was my approach and like, how do I expand that? And how do I think about this at a larger scale? And then put these forms together and then compare them together. Um, so I'm thinking more narratively. Um, and obviously again, obviously again, like very like painterly approach, um, kind of traditional. I've been like drawing and painting for a long time. Um, the way that it's evolved over the years has, I, I just got like really captured by oil paint. Um, so like I've made my panels myself, I prime them, I uh, pay particular attention to my brushes, the type of paint I'm using. So this panel I made myself, uh, like find this and then cured it in my old studio for like six months until I had something to paint on it. And I have a few of those panels around. Um, yeah, it's, it's a process that's gotten me through a lot of different phases in my life and has been very much like on the forefront of like where I put my energy or where I sort of like dive and research. Yeah, it's a lot. It's paint. It's art. It's there's a lot of things within it. Yeah. I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions for Siobhan? Um, what's your favorite like color material or surface to render? I think uh, my favorite surface to render has to be like reflective things. So like in one of the paintings, I had a uh, large like gold foil in the background and that was very fun and I was painting on like a really nice support and I was just like it was kind of complex subject matter but because it was so enjoyable I did it relatively quickly because you know time is weird in those moments um, yeah uh, shiny things <laughs> um, and when you say like this main piece was from like a moment that you experienced is it are you then painting from memory? Are you? Do you take a photo? So this piece, I was working with photo reference and starting with um, how I'm staging it. Yeah. So I had a friend come over. I basically like just grabbed a bunch of objects that I've had like a connection with over the years. So all of these forms are like um, I haven't bought any of those things, and all of them are like older forms that I've had over the years that have like some attachment. And, and I wanted to put them into a context. Uh, for example, um, in here is like a tiny little house inside of like a lantern with a bell. Um, and that's like sort of a symbol 
that I developed in like uh, reflection for my complex with um, with like uh, with homes and stuff as like an immigrant. And so like it's meant to look like a monopoly house, but a little bit different uh, because it's like the same sort of brick and uh, shingles from different places I've lived. Um, and then all of these forms have that same sort of like connection. And so I wanted to put them into a context and like see where I could go from there. Um, and so I used a few different photo references. I'm trying to get better at photography. I'm not that good at it. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, so as I can understand, every painting has a story behind it. Mm -hmm. Just want to look like that. What is the theme that you want to express? So this one's a lot about expansion for me. Um, it is, there's a connection of uh, the, the tether and the tether to the complex um, and the representation of the self. Uh, later in a conversation with my mother, I, she was telling me about how in our culture we sort of burn a candle, in many cultures we burn candles to, uh, as like a representation of the spirit in another plane. Uh, and that's sort of, in a lot of the work that I explored here, there was candles. Um, in this case, it's burnt out. Um, so gone. Uh, but in this case, it's more of like a representation of that self and sort of going forward. Uh, and so the trajectory goes externally, but I don't want to avoid that stuff. So within it, I try to make it very beautiful and like very like bright and saturated. Yeah, it looks um, like you have all candles in every picture. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. So it kind of look to you like a Spiritual? Yeah, it's meant to be the representation of the spirit, so that fire. Um, and yeah, the sort of like the elements that I was playing with was there has to be blue light in it uh, because I was thinking of a memory from when I was two in Sri Lanka and there was like a monsoon and I looked out the window and it was just like, I remember the coldness of it and I remember um, the lighting. And so I was like, I'm going to take that source and then apply that into like sort of how to develop a formula with the work uh, and then apply that into different sort of contexts. Um, so the uh, crate, the work inside of a crate here was based off of a, like another series that I've done before. And it's kind of that same um, exploration of like closed in spaces or like a limitation to spaces because I've moved so many times. I've had to like sort of get rid of multiple things, put them into a small box and so on. Um, I think um, with portraiture and still life, I'm still trying to find the balance because I want to do both. And I think the scale of still life and the figure is something I'll be playing with more. Um, and I don't, I, I, I haven't had, like, I really love doing portraiture, but I feel that I, I care about it the most in the context to the environment and, like, the sensation I'm trying to represent. Um, so when I'm, continuing to explore this, I think uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out larger still life arrangements to put my models in. Or also working with like the reflective surface along with adding more and more elements into it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know you have like a strong drawing practice as well. Yeah. The drawings, do you see those as like a preliminary work for your paintings or do you see the drawing as sort of like a parallel body of work? That Yeah, I think like for me it's about kind of practicing the gesture, because in the painting itself I want it to be as direct and expressive as I can be. So the way that I focus on the drawing practice is so I can like maintain my attention, because I think like um, it can be very easy to kind of like fall into the uh, like loops of disassociation or be caught off. Like I've recently realized that I've naturally uh, I start to see reels on my Instagram, and I like uh, it captures my curiosity, and I like go through it. And I'm like, okay, I need to be able to uh, pay attention more, and like be able to be aware of that um, those things that take my attention. So drawing is sort of a meditative act that I try to bring into the painting, and I think with the painting itself, I am trying to explore the same sort of gesture. Um, so it's I guess it's process for the paintings. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Siobhan. I use colored pencils on paper, and I also do paintings. Uh, they are acrylic on canvas. Um,
these are mostly um, subjects I use uh, right now um, for photographs, like just like reference photos uh, that I get off of the internet. The idea, the goal for me is to one day do my own photography so I can use them to draw. But um, I'm a relatively a new artist. I only discovered that I can draw during the pandemic um, because I got laid off from work, I was bored at home, nowhere to go, nothing to do, everything was closed. So um, I did a few sketches, posted, and here I am today. <laughs> so yeah, so it's just been a whirlwind of a, a journey. So um, yeah, so right now, I don't have my own photos, so I use other people's. Um, I am born and raised in Sri Lanka, so for me, my culture plays a big role in who I pick to draw. Sometimes I go through hundreds and hundreds of photos before I pick a subject, and sometimes actually, I think they pick me, um, and I just, sometimes I just know it, I'm just like, this is what I, so I feel like sometimes the picture picks me. And my style is that I, it's mostly black and white, just pencil, and I pick apart one portion of it to do it in color. Um, each, each picture, I think the, the most difficult part for me is the color part, because each um, shadow is a different color pencil, so it's just like, it's a lot of different colors and playing with it, and I find the pencil part is the easier part. Um, and, and anything that's black background is charcoal, so I use also charcoal. Um, yeah, so that's my process for these. And then, as you can see, all most of them are people, they're real people from mostly third world countries. So I feel like I, especially like, I feel I, living in Canada, I'm born and raised in Sri Lanka, like I said, living in Canada the last several years, I, I, I see the difference in how people here are, how they see life. How you know we take things for granted here, and how blessed we are here. And I feel like a lot of these people, and even when I think about my childhood, and I people back home, you know, kids, they have so little, yet they're so happy and they're grateful. And you know, I, to me, I want I want people here when they see this to stop and think that a little bit. And I feel like. If you take this man, like every wrinkle on his face is a story. It's what he's gone through in life. And I want people to think about that, see that when they when they look at my, my pictures. You know, sometimes I, I bring them to a place and place where a lot of people have never even experienced or seen or had the opportunity to feel that. So through my paintings or drawings, if I can even just for a second get somebody to Think about you know how grateful we are and how how blessed we are and what you know. Yet he's so proud, like he's turned his mustache. He's so proud of his life. So that's what I want to showcase in my my drawings. Now my paintings, on the other hand, these are acrylic. Um, I do love to paint um, the figure, the human body. I feel that um, our each gesture in our body has uh, tells a story. Like I'm standing here talking, each gesture I make kind of, you know, talks about how how I feel. Like you know, like if I move up my hand, it's just like a language. Like they call it the body language. I, you know, I find sometimes you can even have an entire conversation with somebody without speaking one word. Just gestures, your body language, even my eyes. You know, I feel like you can have an entire conversation with somebody just through your eyes. So I just wanted to capture that. So that's why where my paintings go. So I, I, I like to portray the figure. And I, I also feel that most of us, when we put on, like who we are, our body is, is our natural self. He's, he's genuinely our natural self. We, I can be anybody in this world based on my clothing. I can change my persona with what I what I put on my clothes. So my true self is when I'm devoid of clothing. Like it's, it's where I'm very vulnerable is who I am. So I like to capture that for the most part. Um, so that's my um, my paintings and I also like my drawings. I, I'm very detailed for the most part. I, I'm trying
trying to see if I could <coughs> add a little bit of abstract to it, but I keep going back to adding more detail and more detail. So yeah, that's my process. Thank you. Both of these things. Wow. Just a discovery that you could do. Yeah, it's work. just self taught. No, no classes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you said that like, the drawing was so new, is the painting as well, or were you like yes. at, at all before? No, no. So once I started doing this and I once I figured out I have a talent, now I wanted to try everything. Like I wanted to paint, I do a little bit of abstract, I do a little bit of sculpting, which I actually want to develop. I, I feel like I want to go down that route a little bit more. Um, but no, everything is all new. Like I'm, I, first time I went to an art supply store, I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, there's so many different things. Yeah, and and about this day too, like, uh, it's a very very special day for me because this is my very first time. And I, ten months ago when I uh, first show did my showcase was ten months ago when people like when st things started to open up and and I I went to a gallery. Then. And then she's like, my first time. And then she's like, and then she's like, dreamt of one day in my piece, you know. And so this to me today is, is like a big deal. So it's like a big deal. And that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Second generation artist. Uh, my father's an artist in uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, I grew up around uh, art galleries and art studios and uh, art auctions <coughs> and shops. I and, uh, grew up watching my dad paint. And uh, I've been drawing since little boy, since at least the young ones here. <laughs> and, uh, in 2016, uh, my uh, partner, Sherry, she, uh, she convinced me to start painting. So I started painting and then I just opened a whole new thing for me, you know, like, it's, uh, it came naturally, you know, it's because I've been drawing for about 30 years before that, so I already had the art, uh, the imagery on the it was the colors that but uh, I fell in love with that came naturally in the shading. And um, so I painted a, a piece, it was a buffalo skull. And then um, I was like, okay. And then I took a picture of it and I posted it online and somebody bought it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was some crazy incentive to keep on going. So, <laughs> so I painted another piece. It was uh, an elderly woman, almost like down at the end, but kind of more uh, without too much detail, and that's all. So then I was just, so I used that one that night to buy some canvas, some paint, and then I was painting. And I'm, I'm standing here earlier looking at these pieces, and this is kind of like an evolution of what's been going on with uh, my art. And when I first started out, my pieces kind of looked like this, but I didn't know what to put the paint, because I was, uh, I was just saying earlier um, that I thought art had rules. Me being an indigenous, I thought I had to do indigenous artwork. <laughs> so I tried to learn as much as I can about uh, my people and the spiritualities. And so the only thing I was comfortable with was drawing animals. So I painted this cougar. And then uh, it's painted this wolf. So I got the idea down of the colors and the shading, and I wanted to do more. So I painted this one. This one is a painting of my partner. She's a holistic nutritionist, and uh, she loves nature. So uh, she's also helped me with this whole process of uh, becoming an artist. So I wanted to do something for her. So I painted her meditating as this tree, and then, uh, I also, growing up, I also read a lot of comic books. 
That's what taught me to draw, just the big bright colors in comic books and just lines and all that. So I, I wanted to do that. So this is one of this is like the first step into another step into evolving as an artist. And I started doing these dark lines and these bright colors, you know, and then it just came out to this beautiful piece. And then I was like, okay, I can do that. People accept that. People like that. You know, they they didn't see me as uh, you know like as an indigenous artist, even though I'm an artist who's indigenous, you know, I, I'm doing something that, that's not that, that's not indigenous work. So I like that. So I went down to doing more stuff like this. And um, in Saskatchewan, I went I was uh, in ninety-three, I was uh, in a residential school. And this was back when uh, before the uh, or Catholic was there and all of that weird religious stuff. And uh, what happened is, is they kept the schools on the reservations so they could have the convenience of having a school. So the kids would go there and learn and be educated. But the elders there saw this, didn't, didn't see it as education, they saw it as, as a building of horror. So a few years ago when they found, uh, on the news, the media was telling about all of these bodies that they found in the registration on the schools. I was at one of those schools. I played on the grounds of the schools. I was I was on top of these bodies, and that messed me up. It, I was I went to a dark place for about almost a year, and I was just not well in my head. And then when I came through, this is what this is the piece I did to honor these these children. And it's called Untitled, not because it doesn't have a title, because these children don't have titles. And I wanted to make sure it's small, just like the children were. And I wanted to make, make these uh, little moccasins. And that was a way of me healing. That was a way of me reflecting on what happened. And so I, that's when I came back. And when I came back, it was like I was a whole new artist. I wanted to do that. I wanted to express things, you know, like, and that's where this came from. This piece is, uh, I call it uh, Mother Bear, and I nicknamed it Skoden. And uh, I'll tell you about Skoden later. <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted to make this piece of the strong woman breastfeeding her child. But what happened was, is I couldn't get her head right. I couldn't get the face, facial features right. Her head, there's about five heads underneath, like layers and layers and layers. And, layers. <laughs> and finally, one day I had it, so I just got a brush and I just made it all white, and then I walked away. And said, Sometimes you have to do that. <laughs> you know, just, so I came back the next day, sat down, and I looked at it, and I just started drawing. And then that's where she came up. So, but because she fought so hard, you know, to, to come out of this piece, it totally changed the whole feeling of this painting. So I put the red hand on her face, and I put a war club in her hand. And she's, she's sitting there, you know, only covered in the towel, breastfeeding her child, and she's protecting it with this club, and she's got this, this, this uh, look on her face, like, you know, I want to try it, you know? <laughs> and that's where Skolden came from. Skolden was a uh, uh, slang. It came from a video of this uh, native guy, and he was, uh, about to fight. So instead of saying, let's go then, he said, scolding. And that became a symbol, that, 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 became a, that word became a symbol for come and come and get it, you know, scolding. So that's why, that's where this came from. And then there's the elder I did over here. I don't know if you can see her. That's, uh, my, my grandmother was in the residential school. And she went through some tough things and she told some stories and all that. She's, she was a fighter until, uh, until she passed away, so I wanted to, that's not her, but I wanted to do a, something to symbolize the other women who are, who are surviving and who are going through, through some stuff, but uh, who are still healing, who may never heal, but they still live on because they have to, because they have family, you know? So that's what, that's what this piece symbolizes. Right? You know, she's, she's got some, some pain, 
you know, like there's a, I put a white line around the fire to symbolize a brightness that's around her. Like she's still holding on to this, this light. So, and um, I didn't realize I was going to talk this one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. So, like to talk. Yeah, well done. So yeah, that's uh, the, uh, the end, I guess. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. I'm. Uh, I don't like to do um, same thing over again. Like if you see my work, it's kind of all over the place. It's got all these different subjects. Um, I like doing animals. I love doing elders. Elders have a have a face, the lines. Like like you said, what the lines? You know, you get, there's a story to it. And um, I want to do more. Um, edgy stuff like her, like this is this is like the last piece I did, and um, I want to put my take myself out of a comfort zone and just see what I can push with my art, you know, and see where it goes from there. What's the meaning of the red hand? The red hand is uh, a symbol for uh, awareness and. Um, standing with uh, murdered and missing and indigenous women. Before it was, uh, before that happened, it was uh, the color red meant power. It meant, this, uh, handprints are, uh, are a powerful symbol in our, in, 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 uh, our culture. They uh, represent family, they represent being, they represent identity. If a hunter would go out, uh, he or she would get, handprints of their family put on their bodies to say that, you know, you're going out into a hostile environment, we're here with you. So they put their hands on it. And uh, so the, the power of red became a symbol for murdered missing indigenous women, so they put it over their faces to be able to say, you know, wow. it's there, you know, and then we're going to speak through the handprint, and, you know, we're not going to be silenced. So yeah, that's what that's about. Mm -hmm. Um, when you paint these subjects, like, is this based on a photo, or really have you just created like these persons? Um, I have uh, uh, anxiety, you know, and uh, I don't want to upset people. So when I find somebody that that I see online, I don't know this person, so I don't want to capture their their image. So what I do is I go on the internet and I look at hundreds of, of pictures of people. And I say, okay, I like the eyes on this person. So I'll, I'll use the eyes. I like the nose on this person. I love the way the head's tilted. I love the lips. And together, I put together a person that, that I like. But it doesn't always, it's not always that simple because when I put it together, you know, the, the, the painting has to tell me that, you know, that that's, that's who they want to be. So that's why there's like a whole bunch of different heads under there, and, you know. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a combination of uh, a lot of people. So there's a lot of people in this in this woman right here, and, and the elder at the end. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, you okay, well, thank you so much, Ren. Yeah. Thank you for coming.